Um, I'm Christina Rengo. I'm at University College London, and it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Professor Genevieve Mousny, who is a director of research at the CNRS in France. And she's working in a very exciting area. Her team work on chromatin dynamics, and she's a world leader in understanding genome organization, especially in the context of development and, and in disease, specifically cancer and in particular understanding how histone variants, chaperones and modifications influence cell identity during development. And for her excellent research, she has a number of very prestigious fellowships, particularly membership of EMBO, uh, membership of the French Academy of Sciences. She is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. And uh, in recognition of her, uh, her, her contributions to the field, she has coordinated the Epigene CIS Network of Excellence, which also had the aim of involving more systems biology in her research. And as well as receiving very prestigious ERC advance grants, she has um, received uh, numerous other awards, including the FEBS Award for Women in Science, joined with the EMBO Award in 2013, and the Grand Prix FRM in 2014. She's also served on the EMBO and ERC councils as well. And she now co-chairs the European FET flagship, the Lifetime Initiative, which is exploiting single cell technologies for exploring cellular trajectories, and which I think we will hear something about today and which I'm very much looking forward to hearing more on. So I'm um, looking forward to your uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Janine. please start. Okay, so um, uh, I guess <laughs> we should uh, share screen. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be with you. Uh, although I feel a bit like an imposter, I'm not uh, a computational biologist, so uh, bear with me. Uh, just to check, uh, I want to make sure that uh, we're on the right uh, sharing mode. Uh, do you see my slide? Can someone just tell me if it's okay? You, you see the first slide? Okay, so uh, I will get started now. So um, I would like to uh, share with you uh, the interest uh, I've been uh, um, in, well, which has motivated me over years so that has to do with chromatin organization and how dynamic it can be in relation with the cellular fate. And I would like to take this particular opportunity today to open up on the lifetime perspective, which is an initiative that I've been uh, coordinating uh, together with Nikolaus Strajewski. So uh, if uh, um, I can move forward, uh, okay. So uh, the main uh, question from my point of view uh, has been really to understand how you shape a complex st structure starting from the inform. So this is really going back to the theory of epigenesis, which was put forward by Aristotle. And uh, uh, I've been using a lot of Xenopus uh, uh, system in my work. So this is why you can see uh, this um, uh, um, plastic dough uh, representing potentially cell giving rise to a whole genome. But the, the, the important point I'd like to make is that metazoan development uh, um, brings up several key challenges. So uh, there's a careful uh, time set of changes in cell behavior to move from the egg toward a complex spatial and compositional pattern of cell type. And, and so this is a long-standing issue. And uh, if we go back to uh, the concept of epigenetics, which uh, bring together the term epigenesis and genetics, uh, it uh, really uh, was put forward for the determination of cell fate by Waddington uh, with the cell uh, choosing a path in a, a landscape as uh, drawn here. And you can see how that has been revisited in the context of uh, an artistic view uh, by uh, Paul Harrison uh, in the Epigenesis Network of Excellence uh, that uh, Christine mentioned earlier on where we thought it was important to bring uh, more systems biology into the way we could question what happened to cell fate. And so uh, uh, moving from uh, the chromatin, from the epigenetic landscape, I can uh, get you to the chromatin landscape. Uh, and uh, I've been interested in understanding how you go from the organization 
of the basic unit of chromatin, that is the nucleosome, which comprises DNA wrapped around histones. And these histones can come in different flavors. Uh, and these are called histone variants. And, uh, and they have a cognate chaperone that can uh, help to um, deposit them onto DNA at different places over time. And then there are various modifications that can be imposed uh, over the histones as well as on the DNA. So enzymes are key uh, in these uh, um, reactions. And there are factors that can read the, the modification and their combination, and also factors that can remodel the organization. So all together, they will contribute to this uh, uh, variation on this module, but also on how higher order structure will be uh, organized. And so there are multiple scales, uh, multiple scales in space and time to consider. And we have been learning a lot from omics and imaging at these different levels. And clearly, this is raising a big need uh, for computational biology at all levels. Just to stress uh, the latest uh, approaches using high C uh, experiment that could uh, relate to uh, the megabase uh, scale down to much lower scale. And we really want to understand and bridge this gap in uh, the way we can characterize uh, the organization of the genome. So having said that, uh, I uh, would like to, uh, oh, it's not moving. Uh, sorry, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I went too fast now. Yes, it was moving. And so uh, uh, the, uh, the point is uh, how this can be important during normal uh, development and in disease. And in disease, I, I would like to stress the case of cancer where the importance of uh, these factors have recently been put forward, both for the factors involved in the position of the histone variant, but also uh, the histone variant themselves. And you can see uh, in this work uh, from the Blenis lab uh, that uh, came out last year, how they could see that uh, in terms of uh, metastatic tumor, the ERP pathway lead to suppression of uh, the CAF1 factor, which is key for the deposition of the replicative variant. And this downregulation is accompanied by uh, the deposition of the uh, other variant, H3.3, via the hurry pathway. And this is leading to aggressiveness inducing factors and metastasis. And so uh, in this context, you can detect increase in chromatin accessibility at, at these places and uh, this uh, altered uh, function of histone incorporation. So chromatin thus appear as key in biomarkers in the context of cancer, but also the chromatin regulators at, as potential uh, target for intervention in cancer therapy. And uh, if we uh, take that forward, uh, uh, this is stressing uh, the possibilities of exploiting a number of epidrugs. And so there's a, a number of uh, epigenetic uh, targeting uh, in active area in drug development that could be uh, novel opportunities in particular for solid tumors, uh, about 25% of them. And so, although I don't want to go in the detail of all the hallmarks of cancer, but you can see the different types of uh, therapies to consider and potentially how they can be used in combinatorial treatment is a, a key thing. And to date, uh, one of the key aspects in the area of uh, tumor study is uh, the issue of tumor heterogeneity. And there's a lot we can understand from intertumoral and intratumoral heterogeneity, because there's a need to be able to target properly the right cells in their right state. And so here, uh, this representation taken from uh, the review from uh, the Sauvage shows that there's a coevolution of neoplastic cells together with extracellular matrix, vascular, endothelium, stromal, and immune cells. And the tumor cell niche is dynamic. And so it's important to follow this heterogeneity of cell types in time. And this has been a really an important area of work in the past few years. 
And to illustrate this aspect of heterogeneity, if we consider the cell type in the, the cancer cell uh, at the level of the tumor, here the analysis carried out with uh, glioblastoma shows in different glioblastoma, different cell types. And you can see sometimes some of one tumor can be found as well uh, with sharing uh, properties in terms of their transcriptomic uh, uh, profile with others. If we look now at uh, a chip seq analysis, here trying to use single cell analysis, looking at H3K27 trimethylation in the context of breast cancer, the idea was to look at whether there were differences between uh, uh, breast cancer that responds to tamoxifen and the one that are resistant. And by comparing two groups, uh, you can see here that the ones that uh, are responsive do already share some properties with the resistant group. So there's here a possibility to uh, uh, identify early the risk uh, in this population. So this was at the level of the cancer cells, but uh, then considering uh, the environment, uh, the immune cells are very important. And in this context, uh, with work we carried out uh, together with uh, Sebastian Amigorena at the Curie Institute, we looked at the cell fate commitment uh, of T cell. And uh, this work enabled us to see in this development that there's a silencing of the stem cell memory uh, gene expression program, which is under the control of a histone methyltransferase, which is called SOG39H1. And so this methyltransferase imposes the H3K9 trimethylation modification on chromatin at the corresponding loci. And so this was particularly interesting because uh, the effector cells uh, that uh, have uh, this uh, short leaf uh, will be the one that can have the properties of being cytotoxic towards cancer cell or infected cells. And this intermediate population has a long-lived memory state. And so if we can manipulate the system, that can be very interesting for cancer immunotherapy as a means to increase the potential of the CAR T cell, for example. And to illustrate uh, this uh, analysis, I would like just to show you how uh, the uh, TSNI analysis that we carried out with wild type versus the SO39 knockout cells. This was done in mice. And then uh, looking at the clustering, you can see here uh, that for the effector cells, uh, they show a, a pattern that is much closer to the memory precursor here than they do uh, in the wild type. So these uh, impaired air effector cells express marker of memory T cell like uh, CF6, RNF138, or the IL uh, um, and TRAF1 uh, factors. So uh, this uh, is bringing up uh, the fact that uh, we can consider uh, um, single cell epigenomics and imaging tools to identify at early time rare cell population, both in cancer cells and their neighboring cells to learn about both autonomous and a collective effect. And uh, here uh, I, I'm just uh, throwing for you a series of uh, various publication uh, both from the scientific world and the world press that do stress the promise in cancer research and treatment. And you can see that uh, with uh, this uh, single uh, cell analysis and one um, late uh, publication uh, from Aviv Regev does uh, stress this uh, aspect for high grade uh, serous ovarian cancer. And there's a number of action being undertaken to uh, push for this kind of work and analysis. Uh, uh, here I'm illustrating what uh, the NIH has been uh, putting forward uh, not so long ago. So uh, clearly uh, single cell genomic approach for developing the next generation of immunotherapy is also key. So not only the uh, cancer cells, but also the environment. Uh, and uh, I would like now to uh, take this opportunity to open on the lifetime initiative that I'm co-coordinating uh, with Nicolas Rajewski, with the idea of revolutionizing healthcare by tracking, understanding, and targeting human cells during disease. So what do we mean uh, by that? 
So in fact, I want to take this opportunity even more because the, we have today two publications from Lifetime coming out. First, a Nature Perspective article where we explain how Lifetime can help to improve European healthcare through cell-based interceptive medicine. And uh, this is uh, by uh, also building on a second publication, which is the strategic research agenda that will be available today as well, and which provide the vision of Lifetime, the strategies for the different aspects of the project, and the impact that Lifetime can have in science, medicine, society, and economy. So uh, what is and who is uh, Lifetime? So the Lifetime community uh, uh, comes from this coordination and support action. Uh, that was the start, but today there's more than 120 leader, uh, leader scientists and also uh, medical doctors and others throughout Europe, over 90 European research institutes and 70 supporting company. And as I said, coordinated by the MDC and the Institute Curie. And uh, this is uh, really functioning with worldwide interactions and friend. And I think uh, this is also a systems uh, type of approach that is really needed. And uh, you can see here uh, the number of actions and a uh, group of people with whom uh, we uh, wish to uh, interact at the best to synergize our effort. And you can see in Europe a number of action and some of them will be discussed uh, in this very meeting uh, you're attending uh, these days, uh, like Elixir or uh, uh, the European Infrastructure for you know, Translational me Medicine, perhaps the EOSC uh, Live. And uh, at an international level, I'd like to stress the Human Cell Atlas in particular, uh, with whom we have really a uh, very strong uh, interaction. And it is very important to coordinate and have timely effort in key areas to leverage existing forces, bridge gaps, and make a difference with a strong impact for knowledge and health uh, of European patients and worldwide. And so here, just as an example, I wanted to stress the, the recent uh, alliance um, between HCA and Lifetime on COVID-19, which was uh, to try and push for single cell and omics metadata, um, an, an area on which Fabian Tice uh, has been uh, involved tightly. And so why uh, these uh, initiatives? So, so the idea is that uh, we wish to tackle fundamental health problem in Europe. Indeed, since the beginning of the 20th century, life expectancies across Europe have almost doubled. You can see it's expecting to reach uh, almost 90 years in 2060. And so today uh, we have over 80% uh, of people uh, over the age of 65 and that have at least one chronic disease. 50% uh, have two or more. And uh, then uh, I think we need to consider this chronic disease uh, that accounts for 77% of total disease in Europe and the uh, impairment for people that uh, have to leave job due to health problem. So uh, if you um, live longer, the issue is also uh, you want to live healthier lives. And so when you look at uh, these uh, um, graph, you can see that uh, for Europe, the major uh, problem is definitely the chronic disease uh, that is uh, projected. And this uh, disease uh, persists for a long time period. They cannot be prevented by vaccine, cannot be cured by medication, and they are responsible of over 86% of deaths in Europe. And so in this disease, you can find autoimmune, cancer, cardiovascular, metabolic, neurogenerative, and chronic infectious disease. So these are really important issue uh, raising an urgent need for earlier diagnosis and potentially disease interception. And so uh, we are now nearly 20 years after the sequencing of the whole genome, but we are still unable to predict who will get which disease and when. Many challenges remain to diagnose early disease, preferably before they manifest symptoms, and to choose optimal treatment for patients to predict the response to a therapy and to anticipate the toxicity of a treatment for an individual patient. And so why is that? There are four major shortcomings in our approaches. The difficulty to resolve spatial cellular heterogeneity, 
to capture uh, cellular changes in time and to establish computational framework for understanding the cause and biology of disease. And so this is where you have a very, very important role to play. And so then uh, the other aspect is, of course, to develop experimental systems that allow researchers to manipulate the genome and cells from patient tissues. And so uh, this is because for many disease, we have incomplete knowledge of the cell types and cellular mechanisms that underlie disease. So I think it's probably uh, important to remember that uh, to get going, you had to start from cell the theory. And the cell theory uh, started with the first axiom where Robert Hooke used the word in uh, 1667 with Anthony van Leeuwen Hooke that uh, described cells in details for the first time with uh, this original uh, microscope. And uh, the second axiom uh, was from Matthias Jakob Schleiden, a botanist, and Theodor Schwann, a zoologist, that stated that all organisms are made of small units, the cells. So this was really fundamental. And the third axiom from a German doctor, Rudolf Karl Virchow, who said that only cellular is uh, cellular. Each cell comes from another cell. And ultimately, he argued that disease is caused by changes in normal cells, also known as cellular pathology. So it doesn't come as a surprise that now we are back to uh, this question of cell diversity and plasticity in space and time to identify all these different cells and how over time they can change to get an integrative view incorporating connectivity and environment. So in a nutshell, uh, what uh, we wish uh, is to be able to understand cell fate and what we call trajectory. So how do they choose their paths, their normal path through development and how they deviate uh, to give rise to disease. And so these deviations uh, can be potentially captured uh, much early, uh, if possible, much earlier than when the symptom of the disease appear. And this is what we call interceptive uh, medicine. And so there are three uh, major technology pillars that are the hallmark of the lifetime approach. First, the single cell multiomic and uh, imaging, as I stated before the artificial intelligence and machine learning to deal with all the data that can be brought in and uh, um, integrate them, and the patient-derived experimental disease model. So using this uh, approach, uh, uh, the idea is uh, really uh, to uh, have them working in combination. And here I'd like to stress uh, for you the importance of the artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning with the data integration, the multi-scale dynamic models, and the predictive disease models, and adaptive experimental design, where all the computational work will be crucial. So uh, the uh, scheme that we put uh, to track, uh, understand, and target uh, human cell during disease progression starts from the patient with the personalized disease model to carry out with these three pillars, the analysis and get access to this understanding. So we will be uh, potentially able to detect and predict deviation during disease, induce targeted therapy, and steer disease trajectory back to health. This will be key to inform the physician about the patient tissue of the molecular and cellular history and the future, the consequence of perturbation and enable this early diagnosis and effective interception. And this ultimately should uh, really transform our understanding of healthy life and practice of medicine. So uh, what a type of area? So the disease uh, uh, area were selected through a mechanism that we call the disease uh, launch pad. And so you can see five major disease area, cancer, neurological, chronic inflammatory, cardiovascular and metabolic and infectious. And uh, these uh, uh, have been selected based on these criteria. Well, the high societal impact, the heterogeneity on the cellular level, availability of cell and tissue samples, availability of preclinical model, ethical feasibility, sex-related aspect and alignment with uh, national EU strategy. And uh, they showed uh, when we had a workshop that there were medical priorities to carry out in each of these area with understanding the cell type and state leading to uh, early dissemination and therapy resistance in cancer, 
leading to understanding the mechanism that uh, lead to heart failure in cardiovascular disease, to predict disease evolution and response to therapy in chronic inflammatory disease, and to uh, develop novel immune-based therapy to combat infectious disease, as well as to stratify patients for the main cellular mechanism driving disease in neurological and neuropsychiatric diseases. So we could find cross-cutting area that uh, define commonalities, and uh, there will be periodic evaluation to readjust uh, according to how things evolve to include potentially new disease. Uh, and uh, we focusing here now on data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. The key issue will be uh, to store, to share, access, and analyze data across national border. And so this will require large uh, scale data sharing management, building on European infrastructure to create a flexible ecosystem of computational infrastructure. The computational analytics to integrate, scale, and analyze different types of data to create predictive and predictive models identifying uh, actionable disease feature, and also to have a, a strong data visualization system and dissemination, integrating algorithms, software, models, and statistics, deep learning, and artificial intelligence with visualization tools. So uh, this uh, will uh, be uh, a priority for developing computational infrastructure tools uh, that is uh, depicted here, uh, recapitulating the three major area that I was mentioning, the sharing and management, the computational analytics, and the data visualization and dissemination. And this, in this area, I would like to stress that there are very important impact in terms of short term, the machine learning for single cell data analysis and integration accessible to a wide community, the translation of data set into insight of, insights of disease, standardization and sharing data with a federated approach, standardized format for incorporating molecular data into electronic health records, implementation of benchmarked methods, and integration of existing infrastructure with a data ecosystem with common standards. The long term will be uh, to scale up uh, new methods and uh, visualization tools to large federated cohort data set for the detection of early disease onset and optimal personalized treatment. Then to have accurate machine learning approaches that enable the multi-scale models of disease in patients for data-driven decision on treatment. And finally, novel resources for the infrastructure ecosystem will be needed to access and analyze large data set relying on these federated approaches. So uh, then uh, I, I would like to uh, insist on the, the, the idea of the concept where the implementation of lifetime will exploit the possibility of cell center network for the EU community in various regions European wide, each uh, network having its uh, own uh, pr uh, priorities with single cell multiomics and imaging, artificial intelligence, machine learning, experimental disease model, hospital and clinics connected with various proportion and community interaction uh, with uh, the European infrastructure, S3, EOS, Euro, HPC, the international initiative, I already mentioned HCA, but HubeMap, uh, HTAN, uh, for the nucleome and collaborative research call and services should be open for all principal investigator and clinician. And so for uh, all uh, in each place, uh, research uh, will be carried out with the uh, three pillars I mentioned. The data management uh, will be applied on the medical and the biological sample. Industry and innovation uh, framework will be strong education and training and ethic and society. So if I now complement, because I discussed the research and data management, the industry and innovation, here uh, we uh, will have uh, five area of exploration, technology adoption and development, strategic partnership, networking, brokerage, entrepreneurship, and expert advising. And so uh, for uh, the first one, driving solution oriented breakthrough discovery, fostering transition from lab to market, enabling exchange between industry, academia, and across industry sector, stimulating the creation of sustainable spin-off and contributing to research and innovation policy. 
So uh, this uh, will be accompanied uh, by training and education for excellence uh, to um, be nurtured and to nurture new talent. And so this will be uh, important for the workforce training, for citizen empowerment and for university education. And in all these area, there will be uh, action taken for uh, a strong knowledge dissemination and uh, lifelong uh, learning in, in the uh, training forces. And that should address the need at all levels, scientist, clinician, manager of technology platform, industry partner, lab research technician, clinical support administrator and citizen. So uh, as you can see, this uh, has a really uh, a very uh, long-term uh, impact uh, to all sectors. And uh, uh, with uh, also short-term training that will be uh, important uh, right now. And of course, uh, to engage uh, with the uh, community and, and with all the citizens for them to adopt uh, the approaches. And so this is very important because uh, it's uh, also key to have an ethically responsible strategic research agenda. And so that has been really worked out, uh, spearheaded by Maria Torres Padilla. And so there's a paper also coming out in EMBO describing uh, this approach, where the question about research on patient material and sharing of data sample raised the issue of the biobank, the consent form, incidental finding, industry involvement, privacy, data ownership. Uh, how uh, innovative technology in research and health healthcare are important uh, to consider the personalized disease model and artificial intelligence. And uh, finally, the emerging issue in healthcare, the new perception of health uh, uh, versus disease, the promise making and expectation from people and the equity of access to care uh, for all people in, uh, in all places. So uh, ethics uh, parallel research uh, is important throughout the work. And so uh, here you can see all the aspects that have been uh, considered so far and engaging citizen in all aspects uh, with uh, consultation, dialogue and decision making. So uh, to summarize, uh, you can see that the agenda for lifetime uh, to move towards cell-based interceptive medicine uh, we'll use uh, all these aspects uh, in uh, a manner that uh, like um, millefeuille in French, <laughs> where uh, it should be really uh, strong with the technology pillar, uh, which I mentioned already, with the industry and innovation uh, and the uh, importance of the connection throughout, with the uh, ethical society uh, issue, the uh, importance uh, of training and education, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the network of cell center that will ultimately bring this coherence to the whole thing. Uh, and uh, to finish off, uh, I'd like to um, put forward how the lifetime impact for Europe can be important for science, health, economy, and society uh, with, uh, in the context of science, the um, EU leadership in scientific breakthrough in health to transform European healthcare in our um, society to engage society with an ethical responsibility and for economy to increase European competitiveness. So uh, I think that um, maybe because we are in uh, the context of computational uh, biology here, I would like to stress ethical consideration in this aspect. And here the privacy uh, is really an important aspect. So data protection will require constant surveillance supervised by ethics team and data management team together. Data ownership, this is always uh, important to consider who's the owner and who's the controller of the data. Data will always and unconditionally remain with the patient or donor and lifetime will work towards a unified consent form ensuring sharing of data while respecting GDPR and patients' privacy. For artificial intelligence, the system will unconditionally remain under human control, exclusive use of excellent quality data set, inclusive AI tools that exclude any bias related to sex and gender community or ethnicity, and application of research funds specifically dedicated to implementation under these requirements. 
So uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, uh, I think I'm getting at the end. Uh, and uh, uh, the Lifetime community with Lifetime Partner and Associate, this is uh, also you. Maybe many of you are in the audience. And Lifetime only exists with and for you. You should uh, spread the word. And here I would like to thank, to thank uh, specifically uh, the management team, uh, both in Paris and Berlin with uh, Nicolas that has been an amazing uh, chair uh, of this uh, um, uh, initiative. And uh, for this presentation, I uh, had a great help for the lifetime part from Ines and uh, Dörte in Paris. And of course, all the input from Stan, Gorski, Christian Pop, Marie Vidal and uh, Valentine. So if you want to uh, learn more, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, you have here all the information and you can get uh, a lot more out of this. And I think uh, I should uh, stop uh, and uh, take uh, your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Genevieve. So it was a very interesting talk and amazing opportunity. Uh, very exciting initiative, I think. Um, I'm just waiting for the, the questions to come in. Um, perhaps you can tell us something about um, when, actually remind me when it started and how much longer will this run? So uh, in fact, uh, the Lifetime Initiative uh, was really uh, started uh, in 2018. The, well, the idea uh, came about and we uh, began to put uh, things together applying to uh, this uh, action uh, at the EU level uh, that uh, allowed uh, us uh, to be selected uh, in a first round uh, to prepare a second uh, version of our proposal. And uh, finally, the, the CSA started in uh, 2019 for one year. Uh, with the, the goal to put forward this strategic research agenda that should be used by the uh, European uh, Commission to um, build uh, the, uh, some uh, of the tools uh, in the context of uh, Horizon Europe. So it is much of our hope that uh, all the work that we have uh, carried out will uh, turn into fruition uh, at the level of the EU, but also in the different countries, uh, member states uh, to uh, support uh, the uh, potential that uh, these approach offer and exploit the strategic research agenda. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions now, so um, Alfonso, to Valencia, uh, thanks you for the great talk, and I would like uh, to know more about the importance of the data sharing. And um, sharing medical data is still quite a problem uh, for the future of medicine. And it would be helpful if you could elaborate how you see the access to medical data evolving in Europe, and if the German-French axis will help to push the agenda further. So uh, thank you very much, Alfonso, for raising this question, which is really a, a burning question. It's, it's difficult even within a country uh, to share data. And uh, I, I think that uh, there's a very nice example in UK where they have established a system with UK Biobank, enabling a nice way to share things in UK. So this is an example. But the fact is that uh, in each country, there's different healthcare system. And so there will be uh, work that has to be done in each country. And then the idea will be to use a federated approach because uh, uh, the, the point will be to have uh, uh, the possibility to have your medical system in place and your way of doing things, but uh, provide a, a framework for a best way to do this federation. So working out uh, the, the details will of course involve the uh, initial uh, partners and I mentioned already some discussion uh, that we had in the context of the COVID-19 with the metadata analysis uh, uh, with uh, Fabian Tice, And it's uh, a really a very uh, uh, hard question. And we are, we are really uh, working on that uh, as, uh, as we speak. So uh, I cannot say it is solved, but uh, I think that having identified uh, the hurdle we know where uh, we need to uh, put our fingers on and uh, work on it uh, with the people that are ready for it. Thank you. Um, I also have a question from Salvador Capella. 
um, asking about all the, the huge amount of data that you're going to be uh, generating. And in particular, a question about whether you'll be saving the raw data. I imagine that would be extremely challenging and you might only be saving processed or derived data, but it would be uh, interesting to hear some more thoughts on that. So definitely, uh, this, this is a, a, a general question. Uh, storing uh, all the raw data will be impossible. So here there will be a need to uh, decide. And this is where the working group uh, on the data management has uh, uh, really uh, played a, a strong role to, to look into this and uh, then uh, adopt uh, a common uh, approach for what uh, would be important uh, to keep and also what can be shared. So there's the two levels. So, so I, I think that and one doesn't uh, go without the other uh, in the, the way to think about it. So I think that here I, I would very much uh, like to uh, uh, send uh, Salvatore to uh, go into uh, the strategic research agenda to read that part to have uh, more, more details on where uh, the group has uh, been into this topic. Thanks very much. Um, and there's also a question now from Fabienne Thies, who would like to thank you for this nice talk and ask you where you see the future trends and hot topics with the big computational needs effectively when in particular when merging single cell approaches with clinical settings. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, Fabian is uh, offering me an opportunity to put forward one thing that I feel will be very, very important is the spatial uh, uh, transcriptomic and epigenomics, if we can get to that, because it will be very, very interesting to uh, reconstruct uh, the whole uh, ecosystem uh, of the tissue. And so for that, uh, the tools uh, will be important to develop uh, in terms of computational work to uh, be able to model uh, where an uh, a cell come from, but then even within the cell to go down to the molecular component uh, and how uh, they change. So I think uh, this is the multi-scale. So the cell and within the cell, uh, if I can say that uh, um, will be a very, very important for the future. Thanks very much. Um, there's a question now from Alexis Coulomb who would like to ask if, if you're aiming, I imagine you are, to train neural networks for image analysis on this very, on this very large amount of data, and would you make them publicly and practically available? Well, I think this is something that uh, should be done. And so uh, I, I haven't done that uh, directly myself. I have uh, people I'm collaborating with uh, that uh, are working on this. And uh, I think we, we do need uh, this uh, uh, um, approach for the imaging, definitely. And there's already some uh, that are ongoing uh, in, the, in the context of uh, the Lifetime Initiative. Uh, people like Thomas Walter is uh, working on this kind of things, for example. And uh, there are many other people as well. Thanks. Um, I've got a couple uh, more questions, but I'm going to ask one well, myself before, before then, because it's in the context of what you were talking about, linking the um, single cell data with the clinical data. I mean, one challenge may be how you capture that clinical data and the ontologies that need to be used in order to really mine the data effectively. And my experience of working with clinicians, it's, it's quite difficult to get standardized uh, ways of capturing the metadata. And how do you think you will um, address that challenge? <laughs> well, I think you're absolutely right. This is, this is really difficult. And this is also why uh, the uh, pro proposal is a long term proposal. And so it's uh, also by getting and engaging the medical doctors into the approach so that they can also evolve in the way they're going to uh, um, pick and uh, have uh, their data made available. So we need to have a prospective uh, approach. For the, for the future. I don't think that on uh, past uh, data, uh, things are already available uh, in a manner that will enable to carry out uh, the type of uh, project that we are putting forward. But the, po the possibility there, and it does require uh, a significant training. And so this is also what I have put forward that is embedded into the lifetime approach. Yeah, I think the training is very, is, is, it's is essential, key, isn't it? Um, also, um, an important question, I think, from, um, from someone in the audience, Farid Musa, 
who wants to know about the opportunities for the young scientists, for example, in this audience to engage with the initiative. So how will, will there be opportunities for collaboration or participation or how do you see the initiative uh, opening out to, to other groups? Absolutely, this is, this is key uh, and I definitely want to say that the approach is uh, really inclusive and that we definitely uh, wish uh, the young PI uh, and uh, all the people that have uh, great ideas uh, to join in. Uh, people can sign up on the Lifetime uh, website uh, to become associates and also to participate and be uh, in a position to sort of do some matchmaking, interacting with different people for collaboration. And uh, we've done that uh, um, already in the context of the COVID-19 when there was some um, uh, emergency, but we would really love to do this in a much uh, broader way for, for, for the future. So, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, much work to do, but uh, the young uh, energy and strength is absolutely welcome. <laughs> and that, I, I should further extend that question to students as well. Will there yeah. be opportunities for perhaps internships or where, where they can visit labs or join in the initiative for a short time as part of their PhDs or perhaps even do PhDs with you? Well, we would, we would love to have that. So this is part of the uh, scheme that we had put forward with uh, the Lifetime Academy, where we are proposing uh, some new training, uh, masters and PhDs, and, uh, uh, and this can be uh, certainly uh, an important uh, aspect to, to push for. And I'm sure that there will be many labs that will be super happy to host uh, these people uh, to move forward. Actually, on this note, um, there is a request and I'm from Mustafa Eltaga, and I'm sure many other people in the audience that you show the contact details slide again um, before. Yes. I think we have about two minutes left, so. so I can do that, <laughs> uh, hopefully. Uh, so I just need to do the sharing screen again. So, uh, okay, I share and I put it uh, now. Thank and you. So, uh, if you can, uh, Take your chance. Uh, you should uh, have a look. Uh, and on the site, you have also the link to the strategic research agenda that should be available today, uh, as I said uh, in my in my talk, and uh, also the uh, connection to the different uh, publication that could be of interest. That's wonderful. Thanks. I think we have about a minute left. So if there are more questions um, come in, there's time, I think, to answer one or more questions. If in, in the meantime, I'll ask something <laughs> uh, a bit more esoteric, really. Um, you talked about the opportunity this might give, you know, for, for interventions and for manipulating the system and um, possibly um, personalized medicine and, and diagnostics. How realistic do you think that is within the timescale of this project? Well, it, uh, it uh, really depends. Uh, as I said, uh, in the context of cancer, things are already on the move. So this is uh, uh, relatively advanced and they are already uh, uh, project out uh, for the capacity to try to identify how you get uh, cancer resistance with approaches uh, uh, of the kind I, I've described. For others, uh, it may come uh, on the way, but uh, the model systems are developing uh, also uh, on a daily basis. There's a lot of uh, personalized models with organoids uh, that are becoming more and more accessible that Hans Clevers had uh, really developed and uh, many uh, opportunity uh, should uh, be there to take this further. Thank you very much. Well, I can see we have about 15 seconds left. <laughs> so I think that's just enough time. Um, there's been um, several people. Thank you for this great talk. And I, I would like to thank you very much as well. It's been very inspiring and it's tremendously exciting. Thank you very much indeed, Geneve. Well, thank you. And if someone wants to join my lab, uh, I'm happy to take people on board. <laughs> thank you.